Well, welcome everybody. Um, would like to welcome everyone to our, the, our presentation of the first minute, uh, How to Survive Going Overboard. This is, uh, my name is Lou Sandoval and I'm the current Commodore of the Chicago Yacht Club. Um, I'm pinch hitting for our uh, Race to Mackinac Chairman, Martin Sandoval, who happens to be my brother. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud to be able to put this on as a club. Um, and it's a continued, you know, expression of our commitment to, uh, to continuing ed for sailors. Uh, you know, there's a, a really great thing about our sport as we take on being lifelong learners in the sport of sailing. Um, this incremental learning that we get, um, makes us, um, you know, helps us share knowledge, makes our sport safer, um, helps us learn uh, from events such as uh, what happened on the hook race this summer, um, so that we well, will hopefully prevent that from happening again in the future. Um, you know, so personally, as a, as a past chair of the race to Mackinac in the 104th and 105th, you know, in the post wing nuts episode, um, you know, we've, we've gone through the succession of learning for uh, the, the race to Mackinac. Um, not only post wing nuts, but obviously post Medi in 2018. And each of these events helps us learn because we share this with the sailing community globally. Uh, and it's part of our personal commitment as a yacht club to make sure that we extend that, uh, that knowledge forward. Um, uh, and this, this event is, a, is another expression of that um, as one of the, the, the larger yacht clubs on the, in Lake Michigan to make sure that the entire sailing community um, is able to, to learn from this incident on the, um, uh, the 2020 hook race. Um, so uh, I, I would like to introduce our, our, uh, our guest speaker today, and, and, um, and it's, it's an honor to, to, to be able to present her as a fellow um, uh, marine industry professional. Um, I've had a ton of respect for Sally and, and everything that she's accomplished. You know, she's a, a pioneer and a trendsetter in her own way. Um, you know, it, Sally kind of grew up um, sailing 505 dinghies, um, you know, for about 20 years after she was in college. And, you know, professionally, she's also been a, um, a trailblazer in in working as a sail, sail maker in the Northeast and then, um, and then launching her own sail off on the West Coast. Um, she's, uh, you know, that professionally, she's, uh, she's been a, a, a huge trailblazer on that end, but then on the water and her development as a sailor, an offshore sailor specifically, uh, she's done some, uh, some, some pretty impressive things along uh, with, uh, with Stan Honey, um, her husband. And, and uh, one of the nice things that uh, both uh, but that Sally's done is that, you know, obviously she's campaigned her, her Cal 40 um, and done a lot of uh, Trans-Pacific crossings. Um, they've done some, you know, she's got some time in, 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 as a Newport to Bermuda racer. Um, they've transited the Panama Canal. So, I mean, they've gone to some places in our, on our globe that are pretty impressive. Um, and in terms of the recognitions and honors that Sally's re received, um, she is a twice named uh, U.S. Sailing Yachts Woman of the Year, um, which is, is impressive in its own like to do it once, but to do it twice is, uh, is, is uh, super impressive. And uh, on top of that, you know, Sally's, um, you know, she's given a lot back to the sport and her volunteerism and her involvement. Uh, you know, she's uh, served on many sailing, uh, uh, U.S. sailing boards and panels. Uh, she's um, also been involved uh, as an on the water volunteer in the 34th America's Cup. And she's edited the Safety at Sea Handbook for US Sailing. Uh, she's currently um, a member of the World Sailing Offshore Special Regs Committee, subcommittee. And then she's also obviously the chair of the US Sailing Safety at Sea Committee, uh, which is uh, what brings her to us today. So uh, without further ado, uh, on behalf of Chicago Yacht Club and the Race to Mackinac Committee, um, I would love to welcome um, Sally Honey. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Commodore. Um, I'm delighted to support today's program. I think it's very important. Um, just as a background, uh, U.S. Sailing Safety at Sea Committee oversees five important functions. Uh, one is the incident reviews, such as what we're going to be talking about today. The second is safety training in general to try to um, mitigate circumstances like we're going to be talking about. The third is equipment requirements for um, sailors, uh, also to help with safety. The fourth is communicating with world sailing on uh, worldwide safety issues. And the final is granting of Hansen medals for heroic acts at sea. Um, and we'll be talking about that a little more later. Uh, investigations into incidents such as the ones we're going to be shortly reviewing 
lead directly to improvements in training and updates to safety equipment requirements. Um, the key incidents reviewed over the last several years have involved loss of life, which thankfully has been avoided in what we will review today. Having appropriate safety gear as well as prior training played a significant role in the success successful conclusions of what we're about to hear. Training in both of the, those in the water and those left on the boat who have accomplished the rescues that we're going to hear. So that leads to one of our most important recent functions of the Hansen Committee. For this summer's exemplary rescue of Sarah Peterson during the hook race on Lake Michigan, the Hansen Medal is granted to the crew of Schmoke and Joe, Jeff Schaefer, Mike Rensinger, Mickey Nelson, Nick Ponsaby, Randy Bedden, Mark Lewis, and Rob Walker. Uh, they did a terrific job. We're going to hear more about that um, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Our panel today is going to be moderated by Captain Jonathan Kabach. He's an internationally recognized expert on marine maritime training and education under sail. Over the course of his career, Jonathan has sailed and commanded vessels ranging from the 200 foot fully rigged ship Oliver Hazard Perry to high performance racing sailboats from maritime academy training vessels to luxury motor yachts. In addition, Jonathan is highly experienced as an instructor and curriculum developer specializing in STCW and Coast Guard approved training for co commercial mariners, as well as teaching in US and world sailing safety at sea seminars. Jonathan spent nearly a decade at the US Merchant Marine Academy and Sailing Foundation, coordinating SOLAS courses and directing sail training and marine operations. Jonathan's extensive experience more than qualifies him to lead our panel and sharing their experiences overboard in challenging conditions. So thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, Sally, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, everyone. And welcome once again to the first minute, how to survive going overboard. The subject of crew overboard is always a hot topic. And rightly so, it's been a particular focus at both US sailing and world sailing safety at sea seminars. You know, we discussed the best maneuvers to use to get back to someone. Is it the quick stop? Is it the figure of eight? Do we bring the person back on board amidships or over the transom? All of these are really important questions and worthy of all the time that we've devoted to them. Especially if we take a second to think about the evolution of recreational sailing in the last 50 years. From the emergence first of fiberglass and now carbon fiber, to the fundamental differences in hull design, going from heavy displacement cruisers that you raced with your family, to planing hulls and now foils. In that same time, the cost of getting in at the highest level of performance in the fastest vessels in our fleets has dramatically fallen. And more and more sailors are going around the buoys or on their way to Mackinac Island at speeds of 10 to 15 knots. That's a number that's almost unthinkable for a 30 to 50 foot sailboat when those that conceived those races did so decades ago. As a little bit of context in the drastic change that that represents, I wanted to share some numbers with you. So at six knots, in 22 seconds, you'll be 300 feet away from a crew member that's fallen overboard. At 16 knots, that's down to 11 seconds. And at 25 knots, that's seven seconds. A 20th of a mile in seven seconds. At 20 knots, you'll be four tenths of a mile away in a minute. That means that we fundamentally have to change the way we go about our business, especially in regards to preparing for and anticipating emergencies. So the techniques that, that we're employing now more readily really have their roots in the fundamentals of good seamanship. And you could argue that the proliferation of jack lines and tethers finds its origin in the old adage, one hand for you and one hand for the ship. The body and soul lashings that were commonplace on the great clippers and packet ships as they sailed the roaring 40s or made their way around Cape Horn. You know, as I've mentioned already, we've devoted a tremendous amount of time in our safety at sea seminars to what to do in a crew overboard situation. How do we handle the ship and how do we train our crew for those situations? But what we don't often have the opportunity to do 
is discuss what to do when you are the crew overboard. We're fortunate enough today to be joined by three panelists, all of whom have had the unfortunate experience of finding themselves suddenly in the water in challenging conditions, but with the good fortune made it through their experiences and are happy to share some of their observations and thoughts with us today. But before we do, I wanna talk a little bit about more about the format of today's seminar. So this program is being recorded and is protected by copyright Chicago Yacht Club 2020 All Rights Reserved. As I'm sure many of you are now familiar, this is a webinar style format. So attendees can participate, they can see the attendance list, but not communicate in the conversation. Questions, if you have them, can be submitted through the Q&A feature on the lower right hand side of the bottom menu bar on your Zoom tab. And we encourage you to participate with questions. We intend to have a Q&A session at the end of our formal conversation. We may not have time to answer all the questions, but we still encourage you to put them out there. If you have a technical problem and need assistance, you can email regatta manager at chicagoyachtclub.org. Most importantly, we want you to be a part of the conversation through the chat. So please feel free to share your thoughts and comments. But just a reminder, if you do have a question that you want the panelists or myself to address, please put it in the Q&A. So in my professional career, I regularly train recreational and professional mariners in emergency preparedness, firefighting, abandoned ship. And one of the contrasts that I always like to point out, and this stems primarily from anecdotal evidence, is an inherent difference between those two groups. Professional mariners are legally required, professionally obligated to spend a significant amount of their time preparing for what I like to call the very worst day on the water, where many recreational boaters go out and prepare themselves for the best day on the water, often not devoting enough time to training and the preparation to respond when they find themselves in an emergent situation. And I think the classic example of this is the crew overboard drill that many boats do really, which is just going to chase a hat around in a circle with a boat hook while the skipper motors sails put away, not even up yet, lines all neatly coiled down. That's not reality and that's not when these situations actually occur. Now, even if you are one of those mariners that's committed yourself to a more substantive training for crew overboard, how many of you have pulled a crew member out of the equation and said, okay, you're gonna sit there and take notes. We're gonna pretend that it's you that's fallen overboard. And most importantly, if you're the skipper, when have you ever done that yourself? Creating meaningful crew training starts with a fundamental under understanding of what we're trying to accomplish and the knowledge we wanna pass on to those involved. In the case of what to do when you're the person in the water, sometimes that information is a little dated. So I thought I would share to you, with you some of the things that we've used in the past as training devices for what to do when you find yourself in the water. Remember, the more of your body above the surface, the safer you are. Keep your ears out of water, your mouth open, and your chest and belly along the surface until the explosion cease. In a life jacket and a calm sea, staying afloat is no great problem. If you've been caught without a life jacket, it's doubly important not to wear yourself out or get panicky. This fellow's overdoing it, so he goes under. There's sure to be debris floating about, pieces of shot up life rafts, broken planking, crates, all of which you can use. Very little support is needed to sustain a man in the water. Just a light handhold on a floating object will enable you to stay up for hours. Even a bucket can be used to trap air. And as an additional support, a steel helmet can be similarly used. But don't jump or dive in with one of these on your head. It is possible to transform your clothing into a highly serviceable life preserver. Simplest method is to inflate your shirt Fasten the collar and blow several breaths into the front opening. The wet fabric will trap enough air to sustain you for some time, and you can replace what leaks out. Your trousers can be converted into very practical water wings. Remove them and tie the end of each leg. And I don't know about you, but I'm prepared for Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart to show up and start taking us on a voyage on the African Queen. <laughs> but if you look at it some seven decades later, there's still a lot of value in the information presented in that old Navy training video. But what has fundamentally changed is our understanding of what happens to us when we're in the water. 
especially regarding the onset of hyperthermia and its effect on people. We have to take into consideration new gear that's come of age. AIS beacons, PLBs, they've resulted in a sea change of what it means to be in the water, a very different experience than having your ship torpedoed in World War II. Most importantly, I think the single greatest change from that era to today is the use of life jackets, particularly inflatable ones that incorporate a harness, crotch straps, leg loops. And now that we contextualize it that way, I think it's important to look at some of the more contemporary information out there and sets the context of what we're gonna be talking about today. Some of the leading research on survival in water, particularly in cold water, comes from Dr. Gordon Geisbrecht from the University of Manitoba, affectionately known as Dr. Popsicle. And I wanna share a video that he produced a number of years ago as part of a series called Cold Water Boot Camp. Nine volunteers came to dispel the myth and put the statistics to the test at Coldwater Boot Camp, where Dr. Gordon Giesbrecht, AKA Professor Popsicle, gave them all a dose of reality of what really happens and what to do if you find yourself in cold water. So the first thing that happens is gasping. <laughs> and then hyperventilation, so you have the <gasps> And then you have rapid breathing after that. And uh, so those, those effects last 30 seconds, maybe a minute for some people. But what's important is keep your head above water as much as you can, because if you gasp when your head's underwater, you actually can inhale more than a liter of water in the first gasp. And, and if you do that, then you'll drown. Okay. Do not panic. The psychological stress can actually feed the hyperventilation, so you just breathe uncontrollably, indefinitely. You can actually faint if you hyperventilate enough. And of course, if you're out there with a life jacket on, fainting means that you'll die. The cardiac effect, when you jump into cold water, you may, might increase blood pressure and heart rate, and uh, increasing the stress can cause cardiac arrest. This really only happens if in people who have underlying heart disease. You have one minute to get your breathing under control. Don't panic. The cold shock response will pass. And the more you try to relax, the quicker it will pass. Just so you might survive another hour or more if you have a life jacket on, and you can keep your airway open. <clears throat> Pretty powerful information. According to recently published statistics from the United States Coast Guard regarding recreational boating accidents in 2019, where the cause of death was known, 79% of fatal boating accidents, victims drowned. Of those drowning victims with reported life jacket usage, 86% were not wearing a life jacket. So it's clear that a life jacket and having it on and ready to go is a central principle in in-water survival. But let's learn a little bit more about the physiological effects of being in the water, especially cold water, and what we can do to promote our own survival. Back to Dr. Geisberg. Really cool, hard to, uh, hard to breathe at the beginning. Having to catch your breath from the initial shock. Do not panic because you have one minute to get your breathing under control. You have 10 minutes of meaningful movement and one hour 
before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. So we devised a way to, to remember all three phases with what we call the 1101 principle. The first thing is you have one minute to get your breathing under control. Don't panic, that breathing problem will pass. You have time then to consider your actions. You have 10 minutes of meaningful movement for self-rescue or to prepare to wait to be rescued if you couldn't self-rescue and you're starting to get weaker. And you have one hour before you become unconscious due to hypothermia. Only if you have a life jacket on, because there's no way without a life jacket that you can keep your head above water long enough, okay? So a life jacket really increases your chance of survival, as we all know. But you have one simple principle, the 1101 principle, one minute get your breathing under control, 10 minutes of meaningful movement, and one hour until you become unconscious due to hypothermia. And if you can just remember that, that's your cue to remember a whole textbook of cold physiology. Never think twice about wearing their life jacket. Don't go anywhere near cold water alone for that matter. So make sure that you're prepared wearing your PFD or your life jacket. Tell me a good reason why not to wear it and I can tell you a better reason why to wear it. Well, now that we've talked a little bit about the science and training resources, let's go to the best teaching device there is, which is real world experience. We're fortunate enough to have with us today, three panelists, all of whom have experienced being in the water. Sarah Peterson, Mark Wheeler, and Tim Dorn. I'm gonna ask them quickly to introduce themselves and we'll go in reverse chronological order, starting with Sarah, a little bit about her experience, her first memories when she went in the water, that first reaction, and to paint the picture for us of what happened. Good morning, Thanks, Sarah, how are you? Good morning, Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, I'm Sarah Peterson. I grew up um, on Lake Michigan and in Kenosha, currently live in Fort Myers. Um, my person overboard experience happened on this past summer in July on the 2020 hook race um, off about five and a half miles off the Sturgeon Bay shipping channel in Lake Michigan. Um, so I was on a J111, um, Schmoke and Joe, congratulations to them on their award. And so um, um, just a J111 is a 36 foot racer cruiser that um, can go speeds up seven or plus going um, upwind, double digits downwind, um, a great boat. And um, my first experience when I popped up was to see the boat on her side. Um, I did not have the cold water push immediately, but the two things that I knew that I needed to do was regulate my breathing. And the second thing I said to myself was, um, I know what to do. This doesn't have to be my end. Great. And we'll come back to uh, hear your thoughts a little bit more on that second point. Mm -hmm. Next, I'd like to introduce Mark Wheeler. Mark, would you tell us a little bit about the circumstances that resulted in you going overboard? Sure. Um, I was in the uh, 2017 Chicago Mac race on Meridian, which is a FAR 400, which is a high performance boat. Uh, we uh, started with a spinnaker uh, downwind, and then we ended up uh, in the middle of the night with a, a dry microburst that really surprised the whole fleet. Uh, with too much sail up and uh, the boat was doing about 18 knots when I went over the side. Do you remember what point of sail it was on out of curiosity? At that point it was down when with our biggest spinnaker up and my first uh, impression was uh, I was glad it wasn't really cold water like your uh, film just showed but uh, then it was a matter of uh, making sure I could breathe and making sure I could get my life jacket uh, inflated so I could float. Great and we'll come back to that point as well and our Final panelist today, Tim Doran. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jonathan. How are you doing? Good. Can you take us through uh, your experience and your first sure. recollections, those first memories? Uh, well, 2002 was a record setting year with perfect conditions, 25 to 30 knots out of the south southwest. Roy Disney's high whack had actually set a new course record. At the pre race briefing, we were warned about potential powerful storm system that was expected to hit the fleet Sunday evening. Weatherman Tom Skilling said no matter where you were on Lake Michigan, you were going to get hit. As Caliente approached Grays Reef Lighthouse, approximately 7.30 p.m., we could see the impending squall line to the west of our approach. At the same time, a lake crater was approaching us from astern. Great. And Tim, I'm just going to interject one sec. Can you tell us what Caliente is? What kind of boat? Caliente is a Chris White 44-foot trimaran, custom-built, 
in 2002 with a crew of six. And I'm just going to stop you a second. Just what do you remember that visceral first reaction of being in the water? Uh, watching the boat rotate to flip over and trying to swim out from under it was my first course of action. My second course of action was try to find somebody that was more buoyant than I was because I was having trouble staying afloat. Great. Thanks so much. So three very different circumstances. And just to, to for those not familiar with each of these incidents, I'm just going to quickly share the view of the chart of Lake Michigan, and we can sort of see where each of these occurred. So as Sarah shared with us, her incident occurred just off of Sturgeon Bay on the western shore. Mark's incident happened much further south. And then Tim fell overboard rounding and almost in the Straits of Mackinac here off of Gray's Island. So for our three panelists, what I would love to do is revisit that moment, that first moment, that initial reaction. And maybe if I could ask you just to, to close your eyes for a second and paint the picture for us, the weather, what it looked like, what it looked like from the water and that initial gut feeling. The, the title of our presentation today is The First Minute, and we really want to focus on that experience in the first minute, just like Dr. Giesbrecht talked about, and what happened to you, what you remember, what happened to your body in that time. So Sarah, would you lead us off? Sure. Um, we were hit by a, a squall line, similar situation to everybody else. The boat did an auto tack. I was lifted off of the boat. Um, I did have a tether on. But um, as I hit the water again, the first experience was look, popping out and I saw the boat on her side. So I was like, okay. Um, then um, talking about how I knew what to do. Immediately I knew what to do. I turned my strobe on. My feelings at that point was, wow, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. But um, I knew, again, I didn't panic. So I knew what to do. I turned my strobe on, I got my whistle ready and those kind of things. So I had the proper equipment. Um, in order to handle this situation. So when, when you were sailing in a race like this or when you sail normally, what do you usually have on your person? Um, usually I wear, oh, in terms of equipment, um, I do, um, I wear a life jacket generally. And also I do have a regular strobe on my life jacket. I have a whistle as well as I, I carry a knife. I carry all the standard required equipment that for a crew member racing this type of race. And, you know, this came out in our conversation leading up to today, but can you speak a little bit about the type of life jacket you were wearing? I was wearing um, what they may call as an inherent buoyancy life jacket, which is, I was more of a dinghy life jacket. So um, um, I enjoyed that because I like the fact that it may not, um, that I didn't have to worry about it not inflating, especially at night. Um, I do own a inflatable life jacket as well which i do wear during the day most of the time but um but that's the type of life jacket i had on and you know something that i think is worth pointing out and for our audience today and sarah correct me if i'm wrong you're talking about what we used to call the type three right the, yes. mm -hmm. so that type of of inherently buoyant life jacket is not designed to necessarily guarantee that an unconscious victim will be turned upright that is it is designed to maintain an individual in the water with their head out of the water, um, but doesn't have that same writing moment because the amount of buoyancy in that type of life jacket is actually uh, significantly less than what you would have in what's an offshore, what we used to call the type one, or even most of the commercially available inflatables today. Um, but certainly a trade-off, as, as you illustrated, that it doesn't have to perform its function or it doesn't have to perform a function to do its job, right? It is inherently buoyant. Mm -hmm. um, something that I think really illustrates the fact that we should know our gear and know, you know, what choices we're making by utilizing certain pieces of gear. Thanks so right. much, Sarah. You're welcome. Mark, same question to you. Would you take us back to that first minute, paint that picture, the weather, what was going on in your mind, what you were wearing, gear you went in the water with? Sure. Uh, I was off watch. It was around 1130 at night. Uh, we were, as I said before, downwind with a southerly type breeze. Um, there was a front to the north that was about still two hours away that we knew the wind was going to switch to the northwest uh, and pick up. Blowing about 15, 16, 17 knots or so, boat was traveling. It was a nice, pleasant evening. And then the, um, the boat got hit by a unforecasted uh, dry microburst that actually hit the whole fleet at that time and took everybody by surprise. It did not change wind direction. 
and uh, it was the boat was quickly uh, overpowered. Uh, the crew on deck started banging on the, with their feet, so that's a signal for everybody to come up. There was only two of us down below. Uh, I had all my gear on except for my life jacket. I put my inflatable life jacket on. Uh, it has a metal clip on it, and I tried uh, several times to clip that clip, uh, but I couldn't get it done. Just felt like it was time to get up on deck and help out. Uh, my job is in the back of the boat uh, around navigation or steering. Um, so that's where I headed. Uh, back through the center, as I got right behind the helmsman, I reached over for the uh, port uh, runner winch. And just then the uh, helmsman put the uh, helm over hard to the starboard. And uh, I was flung through the lifeline straight out. Uh, well, it, you could almost not do it if you were an athlete trying to do it now, but I didn't touch the top or the bottom lifeline, just straight on through. I grabbed a, uh, a uh, spinnaker sheet, but I couldn't hold on. The boat was doing 18 knots. And so I was quickly in the water. The water was real rough, um, getting a lot of water in my face. I knew I had set my life jacket up in manual. I'd taken, it was an old style with a aspirin type of a dissolving uh, pill to inflate. And there had been so many uh, inflations on deck, I had taken that out. And I knew that if I went in the water, I was gonna have to pull the lanyard. Um, I didn't know where that was. And I, I got the Velcro open and, and pulled the lanyard immediately. Um, I knew it was gonna be a while before they could get back because they were doing, uh, they were high speed and uh, going away from me fast. I got the, uh, my light out too, which was a steady light and held that up in the air so they could see me. Uh, and then it was a matter of uh, keeping the water out of my face so I could breathe. And also uh, I had to keep my arms over the top of the lobes because I didn't have um, the clip done and I didn't have uh, a crotch strap. Great. You know, hindsight is obviously always twenty twenty, and you know, for all of our panelists, uh, you know, personally, I want to thank you for being so open and forthright in this conversation. But you did raise a good point about taking the time to clip your life jacket and making sure that it was ready to go, so to speak, before you went up on deck. And I think that what you experience is probably something that if we all thought about it, we can readily identify with, right? We need to get up there to help the ship or the boat do the thing. And maybe we are not prioritizing our own personal preparedness in that moment. And obviously, you know, our thought usually doesn't go to, well, I'm going to be the one in the water and now I have a bigger problem set. But I think it's important to highlight taking that extra time in that particular circumstance of, you know, making sure that that, that life jacket is appropriately clipped, that the harness is on correctly, because it may be the difference sometimes between life and death. Tim, would you... Uh, share a little bit more about your experience in the water. You know, you, your particular situation was a little bit different than the other two. And I was wondering if you could sort of highlight um, what you did in terms of that first minute and what you prioritized in your own mind. Well, as I uh, fell from the cockpit into the water, uh, I fell on my back and I realized I must have flipped in midair before I hit the water. Uh, as soon as I came back up to the surface, I realized I didn't have as much buoyancy as I needed to keep my head up out of the water without swimming pretty furiously. I looked around and I saw there was one of my other crew members not too far from me in a fully inflated Mustang. And I turned to him and I said, Mark, I'm not buoyant, I need to get to you. So we swam to each other and I wrapped my arms around him, which helped me stay a little further up out of the water, which we proceeded to do for about the next three, two to three hours uh, in Lake Michigan. And Tim, did, you know, given the circumstances, did you sort of already know that you were going to be there for a while within those first few seconds? Or was that sort of something that came to you eventually? Well, as the boat flipped over, we saw the hulls upside down floating perfectly. I kind of kidded with Mark that this was a good example of inverted stability, uh, textbook example of inverted stability and seeing the boat sail up way upside down. We tried to swim to it together and unfortunately we just couldn't make any headway and I realized I was running out of steam so we stopped for a while to rest and that's where we kind of stood, stayed together for the next two to three hours touching each other. So you know share a little bit more about sort of you know what was going through your mind at that time right you know you're there you're you're not chasing the ship down were you two making a plan how are you supporting each other through the experience? 
Well, the big problem we had was the waves breaking over our heads and swallowing quite a bit of water. I told Mark at one point, I'm glad we were in fresh water because had we been in salt water, things wouldn't have gone so well for us. Uh, we actually started a belching contest at one point just to lighten things up. Watched a tremendous lightning show uh, overhead, spider lightning going across the, the sky over our head. And not really sure what happened to the rest of our crew, which was four other members, where they were, whether they got back to the boat or not, and what was going to happen until they were able to come back to us. But we realized pretty quickly the boat can't come to us. We've got to get to it. Great. Well, thanks so much. You know, in, in our conversations preparing for today, uh, both Mark and Sarah mentioned their backgrounds and experience either on the water, in the military, and other sort of formal training that they had. So I was wondering, Mark, would you talk to us a little bit about what you believe the, the impact was of the military training you had had in, in readying you for this moment? Sure. Uh, I was a, a Navy fighter pilot uh, back in the day. And uh, so two things that we bit of training that we got in uh, water survival there, we got quite a bit, but the two that kind of stood out were the, the Dilbert Dunker, which is a uh, simulated helicopter po uh, cockpit in a big swimming pool that you get strapped into blindfolded and that cockpit goes into the water, turns upside down, and then you have to get out of there. And uh, the second one was a uh, helicopter, I mean, a parachute drag, where you're dragged by this mechanism uh, face down as if you're being pulled by a uh, parachute full of air, full of wind. Uh, and you have to roll over and undo your coke fittings and uh, then get your uh, life jacket inflated. So those two things uh, helped in my, uh, in my uh, first reaction going into the water. But the key to the whole thing is uh, not panicking when you go in. Think about what you have to do. Um, if you're, you know, get your life jacket inflated and get breathing. Those are the two things that are uh, critical to start with. Not swimming anywhere, not thinking about how far down the road this problem is gonna go. It's just all about floating and breathing. Absolutely. Sarah, would you uh, share your thoughts on sort of those first few minutes and, and the mental picture that was going on in your mind? Well, again, uh, like I said earlier, I, you know, when I first got in the water, it was about controlling my breathing, um, I, as well as just kind of that self-talk, really just talking to yourself about knowing what to do. And I've, you know, I've had experience in water safety instructor as well as a lifeguard. So I relied on that as well as a swimming experiences, um, that kind of thing throughout my lifetime. Um, I think that that really helped me as I tried to get things put together as well as knowing where my equipment was. Um, I, my um, strobe was on my life jacket. It was readily available. I was able to turn it on. It was not an automatic strobe. Um, I also, and I wore a lanyard with my whistle on it. And I knew from other stories from people going in that the whistle was a, a, an incredibly important piece of equipment to have. Because sometimes that's heard before they even see your lights. So that's from, you know, people, other, other people's stories, so. Right, and Mark, in your particular circumstance, it was the whistle that brought them back to you, right? That's right. Uh, I did not have a strobe light. I had a steady light, which uh, in retrospect, I think uh, is, a uh, strobe light is much a better piece of equipment. Uh, the steady lights tend to blend in, but even my steady light, which was brand new with brand new batteries, uh, it failed. So I was floating out there uh, in the dark with no light. So the thing that did save me was my whistle. Um, and uh, I, I was blowing that pretty hard. One of the key things on a whistle is that uh, if you go over to the side and the boat's going downwind, it's going to get a long ways away from you. But uh, a whistle sound really travels along a lot further than you think downwind. Absolutely. You know, so Sarah, you were wearing the inherently buoyant type three, the, the kayak or the right. ding sailing life jacket. Mm -hmm. Mark, you had on an inflatable PFD, but that was not appropriate or not fully fastened, correct? That's correct. Tim, can you clarify for us what you were wearing at the time? I, I had the uh, Musto vest type, uh, what I call the bubble pack. Best, which really didn't give you a whole lot of buoyancy, kind of sustained you a little bit. Maybe it would be okay in a pool, but not in the open waters of Lake Michigan. Gotcha. But the it was your friend Mark, right? If I 
Mark, yes. Right, who who had what was he wearing? And that seemed to provide enough buoyancy for both of you. Yeah, he wore a Mustang uh, self-inflatable, and his was fully inflated. He was sitting up out of the water fairly high, so I felt confident if we got together with the buoyancy I had and his together, we could stay above the water. Gotcha. Thank, thanks for clarifying for us. You know, one of the things that often comes up in the Safety at Sea seminars we run is knowing your equipment or owning your equipment, even if you don't own your equipment. The single greatest instance of this is the rearming and maintenance of inflatable PFDs. And if you look at the statistics that have been gathered, either anecdotally or well-documented, of failure rates that happen, depending on which set of studies you look at, uh, I've seen numbers between 3%, I've seen it as high as 17%, but a big factor in that is user error. And one of the things that we found, and in the two Safety at Sea seminars I ran at Chicago Yacht Club, um, or excuse me, I was a part of a Chicago Yacht Club. The, what we did find is a number of people whose inflatable PFDs failed to auto inflate were a result of them either being set to manual mode or actually not being auto inflating PFDs either. Um, they were strictly manual devices. The other failure point that is not uncommon is older antiquated equipment, equipment that might be 20 years old and beyond. The best practice standard is certainly to replace that piece of equipment every 10 years. And I would certainly advise that if you are in a serious incident, if you are using it for a long duration, if there's an emergent situation, much like they recommend with a child's car seat, it's probably uh, sound to replace that device at some point. So there we are, you're all in the water, time is ticking on. I'm just curious, you know, you've all really spoken about a, re a clear recognition that that you had the power, the capability to sort of get yourself out of this situation. Um, you had not become forlorn in the experience. And I think that there's an interesting narrative there for those of our audience not familiar with Outward Bound. Outward Bound is an experiential learning organization that has its roots in the UK. And in particular, uh, a German educator, Kurt Hahn, who fled Germany, moved to the United Kingdom and partnered with a uh, English shipping company with the recognition and, and the owner of the shipping company said that either anecdotally or in reality, he'd much rather have his older sailors in a rescue or survival situation at sea than the youngest, healthiest person. And what that really stemmed from was the personal fortitude, the recognition that they themselves could affect um, their, their rescue or that they had the inherent knowledge and confidence to survive, something that was absent in the younger crew members. And so a whole school of outdoor leadership was founded sort of upon this very basic principle of water survival. You've all spoken about sort of that inherent recognition that you had to do something. In fact, this past a week ago Saturday, the Storm Trisel Club had a symposium on leadership at sea. And the keynote speaker was Sir Robin Knox Johnson. And Rich DeMullen, who was interviewing him, said, you know, talk about leadership at sea. And he said, well, I'm a party of one. I sailed solo around the world. <laughs> but it became rather evident that there's a tremendous degree of responsibility that you as an individual have in this situation. So I was wondering if you each would take us through sort of what you perceived as your real responsibilities in this situation to help those that were trying to get the boat back to you to affect a positive outcome. And Sarah, why don't you start us off? Um, well, a couple things that I did in thinking to um, how can I make myself bigger? I needed to, because I had my strobe, I had my whistle. I initially blew my whistle a number of times when I first came up and had pulled it out. But I also really had a hard time breathing while I was blowing my whistle. So I kind of backed off on that and I've kind of waited until I saw a boat. Um, the strobe, when I would go higher on a wave, I would try to project my strobe higher, um, that kind of thing. So at least I was trying to make myself more visible. I don't know if that's what worked, but it made me feel better that I was just trying to do whatever I could in terms of trying um, to be seen because the conditions was a huge thunderstorm. Visibility was zero. Um, fog had set in. So I really felt like I needed to project where I was, that kind of thing. So the other thing, and this may not be really, is I was able to orient myself because I could see the light panels, um, the 
radio towers on um, on Sturgeon Bay for for a moment. So I had an idea of what direction I was personally, and that helped me to know where I was and things like that. And that helped so that finding some kind of reference in the water so you don't get confused was a big deal in terms of find, trying to help myself through this process. Great. Thanks so much. Mark, how about you? Yeah, the, uh, one of the interesting things is that you're, you're part of a team on a boat. And uh, when you go over the side, you're instantaneously separated as far as the team. They have one job to get the boat under the control and get back, and get back to you. And you have one job in the water to survive and be there. So when they come back, uh, they got some, something to rescue. So um, there's nothing you can do to help them. And that's really nothing they can do to help you until they get back to you. So you're by yourself. So what did I do? I, one of the things that Sarah, that came up earlier when we were talking with Sarah was that with her life jacket, she had to tread water. Mm -hmm. My somewhat to keep afloat with my life jacket, I didn't have to tread water. I just floated. I didn't try to swim anywhere. I kept all my gear on, uh, my boots and my foul weather uh, pants, uh, thinking that would keep uh, some heat in. And um, initially, like I said, it was about breathing and floating. But then it, the water, the wind started calming down some, and I started going through all my gear. I had a my light, my I had an AIS transmitter with me, but I did not have that in auto. Um, so I was working on getting that uh, turned on in the dark, which was difficult. Uh, and I was also uh, tried many times trying to get my buckle uh, buckle on my life jacket because I was afraid with time going on that I would get uh, uh, I might go unconscious with the cold water and uh, slide out of my life jacket. Um, also, what Sarah said, the orientation was uh, I had a thunderstorm that was out to the uh, west that was uh, lighting up now and then, and that gave me the orientation of where uh, north was, where the boat was so uh, an area to look for. I think uh, without some sort of uh, light somewhere, uh, it's very easy to totally lose your orientation with your, your head so low in the water. Um, and basically, uh, in my case, I eventually uh, saw the masthead light of the uh, of Meridian out to the north. And that's when I started blowing my whistle hard. And uh, and they were able to uh, hear it come back. Did you have any sense of time at this point? How long you'd been in the water? You know, I ended up being in the water for a little over an hour, and I really, I kind of had a sense of time. I knew it was going on. Uh, I started. I know I was shivering uh, pretty badly in the end, uh, but then when they finally did pull me pull me out, I was not shivering, so that that part was not a good sign. But. Um, I, I couldn't say that I was in there for you know an hour. I didn't have that kind of an orientation. And Tim, how about yourself? What was it sort of you know the the mental execution going on in your head, and especially sort of the conversations you had said you had a belching contest with Mark, but you know what was it like there? You know as the time sort of started to to drag on. Well, as I mentioned before, the fact that we were swallowing quite a bit of water, I knew we couldn't sustain that very long. So I told Mark, because I had my arms wrapped around Mark, his arms were trapped underneath mine. And I told him what I'll do is every time I see a wave, just ready to break over our heads, I'll yell wave, we'll hold our breath and get through the other side. So we did that for probably 10, 20 minutes and as the sea started to subside a little bit. It, didn't, it wasn't so much of a problem to, to try to stay afloat. The next thing I realized is we had strobe lights that we were given when we left the dock on Saturday morning to use, but we forgot we had them. So I unclipped mine from my vest and I took it and turned it on. And then I actually stuck it on top of Mark's head to give us a little greater range where you could see the strobe light. But we couldn't see the hulls of the boat. So we had no idea what happened to Caliente. We thought it was probably floating upside down, but we weren't quite sure. So we had no idea how long it was going to be before someone could come and get us out. The first good sign we saw was the red parachute flares go off, which told us someone got back to the boat and was able to find the calamity pack, which was secured to the alm, to the netting between the alma and the hull and uh, activated the solid flares. So that was a good sign. That gave us some hope when I think bought us some more time. In terms of my reference point, I kept looking at the abandoned lighthouse, which was to the east of where we had flipped over as my point of reference. 
kind of gave me just some sense of where we were in the lake and we were drifting around. Right. As, as time went on, I wouldn't mind, you know, knowledge is power, right? And I think that in being prepared to be in the water, it's important to kind of know what happens, right? So we talked about the fact that you know, it's initially shocking that you sort of have to collect yourself immediately. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about what you remember physiologically happening, happening to you, both in that first minute, that visceral, and then sort of as time went on, and in particular, sort of what you remember about your physical condition once you were rescued. And Tim, why don't we jump right back to you? Well, as I mentioned, we weren't quite sure how they were going to get us out of the water, so we activated the strobe lights, and then in the in the horizon, I could see a big floodlight come on, and we figured that was probably the freighter that was going through Gray's Reef with us at the time the storm hit us. So I thought maybe they're going to launch some kind of rescue boat to come and get us, but after a couple of minutes, the, the light seemed to stop moving like they were parked and not being able to get to where we were in the lake. Uh, at that point, we had been in the water for several hours, and I was starting to hypo, uh, have hypothermia. I started to hyperventilate a little bit. So I remembered from some training about trying to take cleansing breaths to slow that process down. But uh, that worked to some degree, but it wasn't completely effective. What I had to do was finally get out of the water sooner than later. And, you know, tell us a little bit about when, you know, getting rescued and, and physically... Um, how you felt once you were aboard the rescue vessel, sort of with the adrenaline, I'm sure, sort of starting to leave your system. Well, we, we went in the water. It was twilight. By the time they got us out, it was pitch black. So it was probably 10:30, 11 o'clock local time before they were able to, a boat called Kokomo from uh, Traverse City was the boat that rescued Mark Mueller and myself. And uh, at that point, I was pretty much running out of gas. And I told Mark, I said, I, I don't know how much more time I have here, but we got to get out of this situation. At that point, I turned my to look over my shoulder and I saw the running lights of Kokomo coming up alongside of us. I told Mark, hey, good news, we got a ride out of here. So I let go of Mark. He swam to the stern of Kokomo. I swam over to the side of the hull and grabbed the tow rail, which is a big aluminum tow rail, which I was able to hang on to. And boy, did that ever feel good to have that sense of steadiness after floating around for three hours, not knowing if I was going to get out of this situation. Uh, anyhow, they they pulled Mark out, then I went to the stern, they pulled me out, and I wasn't really able to walk. I had no strength in my arms at that point at all. I was just completely weakened. And I made my way down the companionway, and uh, at that point, my arms started to shake pretty dramatically. I, I couldn't stop them. They were shaking so much. And I kidded with the navigator, if he had a martini shaker, give it to me now, because I'm all ready to go. Um, you know, you Tim, you, you mentioned that moment of sort of thinking, you know, am I going to get out of this? There, I'm, I'm curious, did you have a moment where you were thinking about giving up or, or not sure that you were going to come out of this situation? Um, you did say Sarah, right? I did say Sarah. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. As a matter of fact, um, once, because I did see the boats, I saw the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard had been called immediately. Um, I did see the spot sweep by, but then I saw the boats either get shrouded in the weather or they turned in the in the opposite direction so at that point it was like okay um maybe i wonder what it would like to be drown to drown was my thought because i wasn't really sure if they turned wrong and uh, then what was going to happen um in regards to the other parts of the question that you just asked um my experiences i did have mild hypothermia but one of the things i did experience was a really bad leg cramp, which they indicated was from the hypothermia, which caused me, which concerned me because I thought um, if I can't kick, I can't stay afloat. I mean, I can't continue on. So I kind of put that out of my mind and tried to say, you know, that's not going to happen. You just can't have that. Um, you talked about the visceral. Are you ready? <laughs> you ready, <laughs> Jonathan? In light of, and sorry, family, um, in light of learning about what could happen, and this is what this whole goal was, and Jonathan and you and I talked about this, that everything's on the table here, is that I did have a sympathetic response to this, to this tragedy, the flight or fight. Um, if you can imagine, it's kind of embarrassing, but I did have 
a problem. I did, how do you say it? Um, pooped in my pants. <laughs> so it can happen. And, and I know that this is pretty public, but um, I'm here to teach what happens. And don't be, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, but that's what happens. You know, Sarah, thank you for having the courage to share that story. You know, I, I wasn't sure if it, you'd feel comfortable sharing it. I appreciate the fact that you did. Because like you said, it's important to know, right? You know, yeah. with any situation we find ourselves in, right? Better to know, knowledge is power. Right. right? Or if you're my age and you remember G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle. Right. Um, Mark, you know, for you, was there a moment where you were sort of losing hope or, or thinking that this wasn't going to end well? Uh, yeah, I, it was I kind of broke down a different 15 minutes and that probably the 15 minutes before I saw that light. Um, I really felt like uh, it, it might not end well. And it was uh, m my feeling was the kind of a, just a feeling of sadness uh, uh, that I w you know, wouldn't see my grandkids grow up and th those kind of things. Um, I did what I was working on uh, most of the time was uh, trying to get my life jacket uh, um, clipped. I was contemplating uh, letting some air out of my uh, uh, life jacket because I couldn't, I, I tried every, as hard as I could with the air, you know, fully inflated. I felt like if I let some air out, I might be able to do that. And uh, in retrospect, you know, I think when you're in the water in cold water uh, for a while, you may not be thinking quite as clearly as uh, you, you are normally. And uh, I don't know if that was going to be a good move, would have been a good move or not. Luckily, I saw the light and I had another mission then is to uh, blow the whistle hard enough to, for them to find me. Um, the, the mental deal is uh, it's interesting because you do so much training, uh, you know, safety at sea and everything. The, uh, you, you always know there's a safety net under you. It, no matter how, how hard of training they put you through, if you're not going to make it, somebody's going to grab you out of the water and it's over. Uh, but this was like working without a safety net. Um, at any point, if you gave up, you know, it was done. Um, I know uh, the, the SEALs put out uh, that, uh, and probably your outward, outward bound group put out that your body can take a lot more than your uh, mind thinks. So I was determined not to let my mind be the weak point of, you know, my body was going to have to go. I was not ever going to give up. Perfect. You know, outward bounds model is to serve, to strive and not to yield. And I think that that's a, a perfect example of you uh, shouldn't give up, right? It, it's that mental fortitude that if you maintain that mental fortitude, likely you can get through the situation. Your body, you know, when, when I take students to see it, it's a, a perversely reassuring thing sometimes to tell them that, you know, if you're lying in the rail seasick, you're not feeling good, you can do more than this and you have the capacity to overcome this. Um, you might feel like you're gonna die, but you're not. And if you really set your mind to it, there is very little that you can accomplish within that sort of environment. Everybody is very curious and, and we have some great questions and comments coming in and we'll get to them shortly. Uh, so one, I wanna encourage people to, to continue to post in the, the Q&A section and we'll circle back to them. But there's a lot of curiosity about what was going on on the boats you fell off of or the boats that rescued you and wondering sort of if you discussed what was going on in that circumstance while you were in the water after the fact. So maybe we could circle back with, uh, or Mark, why don't you start us off in terms of talking about what was going on on the boat um, while you were in the water? Sure. So uh, when I went to water, the, we had the A2 which, up, which is our, our biggest spinnaker. We had a staysail up. We had uh, the J3, the heavy weather jib, uh, tuned in uh, up on deck. And we had the uh, lazy spinnaker sheet, uh, sheet through the boom for, a, uh, uh, for an emergency takedown. We were all set up. But... Uh, things happened fast. That wind started going up, up to 45 knots or so. And uh, one of the interesting things on the boat is that not only do you lose one person, uh, you also have other people out of position. So our pit man was in, because we were going fast, people were aft in the boat. And our pit man was one of the ones that were keeping an eye on me, pointing at me. So our normal pit person wasn't there to take, be involved with taking the sails down. So that complicated getting the sails down. Um, they eventually did uh, get everything down. And so it was just mainsail only. And when they turned to come back up towards me and they were about two miles away, um, they were knocked down and held down for a couple minutes. 
Uh, eventually that stopped. They uh, turned and started coming back, uh, got their line squared away and uh, eventually took the mainsail down so they could hear better. Uh, mainsail down, motored, and uh, they would stop motoring every 15 minutes. And the orientation coming back, trying to find me uh, when I, I kind of brushed on this strobe light versus steady light, there were a lot of steady lights out there and they ended up chasing a lot of the steady lights. Uh, so that's why a strobe light, I think it's much, much better uh, rescue light. You know, incidentally, there's a, the, the origin of a lot of safety at sea practice is SOLAS. The first SOLAS convention happening in the wake of the Titanic casualty. And it's well documented that people saw flares coming off of the Titanic, but knowing that the ship was due into New York the next day, they thought they were fireworks celebrating the inaugural voyage. It wasn't until after Titanic that they standardized red as that emergency distress color. And, uh, you know, to your point, if uh, a light blends in, if we don't recognize it as a type of distress signal, it becomes a lot harder to sort of hone in on and, and come back to that person. Absolutely. You've all sort of shared some, some great observations about your experiences and, and have been so open with us and I appreciate it. Uh, I do want to take a little bit of the time that we have left to talk about, uh, you know, again, the hindsight 2020 changes that you've made either sailing with those same crews or personally in terms of the equipment that you sail with or the, the training that you've undertaken since you found yourselves in the water. So maybe Sarah, would you start us off? Sure. Um, as we've talked before, I thought um, in terms of some of the things that I did in the water, um, I wouldn't change. One of the things um, was about the water coming in. I would turn my back to a wave. Um, when I get on top of a wave, I tried to make myself a little bit more um, visible. But in terms of um, st even starting out, before we even got on the boat, our skipper, Jeff, um, who was also the owner of the boat, um, sat us down. We knew it was going to be a windy race. And he sat us down, made sure everybody had the proper equipment. Everybody had it. Um, so we were all prepared with our equipment. Um, when we came to the storm, we could track it. We were prepared. We took the mainsail down. We were under the number four when we got nailed. And then the wind shifted dramatically. I had a harness on. My harness let loose at the chest level for whatever reason, I do not know. So that's how, because we were all clipped into jack lines. So those kind of safety precautions were followed and those kind of things. So I think um, hindsight might be, I've talked to enough people through U.S. sailing and things like that, that I probably need new equipment um, in terms of a new life jacket and some of those other things. So we're going to be taking care of that. Um, I did not have an AIS. Um, that would be something to consider. Um, obviously, it would have been much easier for them to find me if I had one, because the, all they had was a, um, they had the lat launch, but for a, uh, other reasons, um, they took a photo of it because the GPS would not lock in. Um, and so uh, our crew member Mickey took a, her phone out and took a photo of the lat launch so that they had a reference point. So that was a pretty incredible forethinking um, piece. Um, so then I guess the other thing, so I would do more personal equipment and be more uh, aware of some of the things that are out there that are, are more um, technologically advanced than the equipment that I had. Um, you know, this, the crotch strap was a big deal because even in the type of buoyancy I had, it was riding up and I had to hold on to it, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of things out there that are available that you should reconsider um, taking care of. Great. Tim, you know, you have the longest amount of time that's elapsed since your incident, you know, nearly 20 years now. Um, what's changed in your best practice or the things that you do to prepare to go sailing? Well, one change I made is I stopped sailing on Lake Michigan and started sailing on Geneva Lake up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, a small inland lake racing e-scouts. And they, kept, they capsized fairly often. So I've gotten used to that part of it. But of course, with the e-scouts, we always wear PFDs from shore to shore because uh, the boats are just such high performance and they're likely to tip over. But uh, once I did get to shore, I bought one of the best self-inflatable vests I could find money would buy. And I also incorporated an automatic strobe light so that if this thing went off, it triggered the strobe light in the event I was unconscious when I hit the water, 
at least the strobe light, because I, I had a lot of faith in that. He had just, they told us that helped them find us that night by putting the light up on top of Mark's head. So uh, I've changed my world a little bit, but uh, I'm still sailing nonetheless, and I still absolutely enjoy it. I, I'd hop on a boat in Lake Michigan in a heartbeat if I had the offer. Great. And Mark, I know you've done uh, some pretty substantive work uh, sailing uh, with a new boat, right, a Car Creek 40, and, and some of the changes you've made to that boat in light of the incident. So I was wondering if you could share some of those modifications. Um, on Well, on my personal gear, I got a new life jacket uh, pretty much immediately. And uh, and there's some, there are good ones out there. I don't need to push any particular brand, but um, it's got a strobe that is on a, uh, a pole that comes up and it turns on automatically. I got my AIS uh, personal transmitter in there and uh, I've got it set up in auto. And I, I'd like to emphasize that. I think uh, everybody's afraid of having their AIS go off uh, accidentally. And uh, it, it just, just won't happen. And even if it does, it's not the end of the world. It's a, only in, within five miles and you can figure it out and get it turned off. So you really should have your AIS uh, set up so that the automatic part is uh, when the bladder inflates, it, it pulls a string basically and, and, uh, and sets set your AIS off. I've got uh, another light and I've got uh, two whistles in my... Uh, in my life jacket. And I also have uh, crotch straps. Crotch straps has gotten a lot better too. Initially, those things were uh, annoying to everybody, but now they've made them, uh, I don't know why, put them in different location, but they are they hardly no notice that they're on. On the boat, uh, we just did the SRC, uh, the first of uh, the four series uh, last week. Uh, on this car kick, we've had, we have um, man of board buttons on each side, right by the uh, wheel. So if somebody goes, you just hold that button down for three seconds and it marks the GPS position. Uh, we made sure the pit is well, well uh, uh, documented so that somebody that is not uh, used to work in the pit can know which stopper is to whatever they need to do. Uh, we've got a radio in better position. Uh, we've got a uh, computer set up. So tracking uh, on, a, on some boats that have a good nav station, that's probably a, just a normal thing that you have a chart plotter with a track going all the time. But these wet boats, uh, it's difficult uh, to keep something dry, but we have a computer set up running all the time down uh, behind the engine that has a track going the whole time. So you can come back on the same track. And, um, and we have jack lines down through the center of the cockpit. That was one thing, uh, you know, in that 2017 race, we totally complied with the, uh, with the rules for the, uh, the safety rules for the event. Uh, but AIS was not a requirement for the boat. Uh, we now have AIS on the boat and uh, you know, you just have, have jack lines. It doesn't necessarily, didn't necessarily say that you had to have them in the cockpit. Some, some races do say that now that you have to be able to clip in when you come out from down below. So we have them down the center and down the sides. Uh, it's probably about everything, but it, uh, they're all really good improvements. Yeah, that's a, a pretty substantive list. You know, one of the things that I think uh, I'm always leery of is in the proliferation of better technology that we become over reliant on it because I think we have several examples uh, among the three of you where uh, whether it was a user error situation or equipment failure the the item didn't perform as intended and had some interesting consequences or there was a struggle to utilize the item right so in Sarah's case um, and I don't know if we covered in, in the conversation here, Sarah, but you had an issue with your clip, right? You were clipped in in the, the clip I was. released, right? I was clipped in to the jack lines with the carbiner and it was the snap shackle at the chest level that released. Great. And then, you know, uh, Mark, you were struggling with that, the clip, right? Even before you were up on deck and you sort of said, I got to get up there and I got to help the people. Right, not having the opportunity to get that fastened appropriately, obviously, with some pretty big implications once you were in the water. And Tim, certainly, you know, uh, using a, a type of equipment that maybe didn't have the best support for him, um, and certainly changing to a, something that has a lot more buoyancy now and sort of looking at the whole selection process probably a lot differently. There's some great questions coming in. You know, our goal was to, to shoot for somewhere between 75 and 90 minutes here. And I have no doubt that we're gonna hit the 90 minute mark and keep going. So just to let folks know what the plan is, uh, we're gonna take some Q and A here shortly. Um, and then we'll sort of formally wrap up the proceedings 
um, at the half hour mark. So um, I always have to do a little bit of math here. I believe it's what ten, it's uh, going to be 1130 your time. I'm out on the East Coast here. But our panelists have been gracious enough to stay. They'd stick around for a few minutes as well as myself. And we'll keep going with the questions. But we will sort of do a, a formal wrap up in about 20 minutes. Before we get to the Q&A section um, and a little bit of closing thoughts from folks, there's uh, some equipment uh, clarification that I'd like to provide people and a little bit about on best practice. So this is actually uh, some slides that we've used at the Chicago Safety at Seas. And again, what we're looking at here is in particular the difference between a personal locator beacon and a personal AIS or a, an individual's AIS transponder. So what we're looking at here is a personal AIS beacon or a PLB. And the most important thing to understand about this particular device is this is a mini EPIRB, which means in particular that when it comes to who's gonna get notification, it's not gonna be any of the boats that are near you or next to you. This device is intended to reach up and signal a satellite that satellite information gets transmitted to a rescue coordination center, and then professional assets can come and utilize the homing beacon within that device to come rescue you. Now, if you're in the middle of the ocean, that's a great thing to have. There is a lot of value in a personal locator beacon, but what I certainly advocate for people and is becoming the best practice is to have an AIS man overboard unit. And most particularly what this does is it takes the GPS position, but it broadcasts AIS in the same way that uh, another boat does. Now, on newer units and with certain coding, it will use a different symbol on the chart plotter, but it will also, you can program them because they all have their distinct identification number or their MMSI number. It is coded as a nine series number that indicates emergency and a crew overboard. So what it would do is, and you can see sort of a chart uh, display here, it would indicate that this is the position of the man overboard. As you know, the old joke goes, if you take the search out of search and rescue, you've solved 50% of the problem. I would advocate if you take the search out of search and rescue, you've probably solved about 85% of the problem. So it's a great device. Uh, they've certainly become far more affordable. I think all of the brands perform um, very well. I don't have a favorite but certainly something to incorporate. Mark really raised the point, um, and that's, sorry, what they look like. You know, they're probably no more than six inches long, an inch wide, and uh, really, really easy to incorporate into your inflatable device. Now, one of the most important things, and Mark alluded to this, was that, you know, a lot of his stuff was on manual mode. And what we encourage everybody to do is make sure that that personal AIS unit is automatically deployed. Now I'm going to uh, share with you a piece of my advice. Uh, I speak solely as myself, not on behalf of any other organization. But even if you have a automatically inflating uh, life jacket, I still want to encourage everybody's first response to be going for that cord and manually inflating that device. That is standard practice within all the, the professional rescue agencies and entities, our military. It is ingrained in muscle memory. If you find yourself going in the water, you are manually activating that life jacket. Um, and there have been a number of people that have shared uh, stories about either not submerging enough for their particular type of activation device to automatically inflate their life jacket or not having the mechanism appropriately installed. But most importantly, if you know that you have to pull that cord, let that be the primary means of inflation and let the auto inflation be a backup, right? I think so often as our equipment gets better and more and more equipment has automatic mode, we become reliant on all that equipment to perform its function without our involvement. And you know, I'll take this all the way back to a question that comes up on the lifeboatman exam uh, given by the US Coast Guard, which is what is the single most important resource that a crew member has in a man overboard or abandoned ship situation? And that is themselves. That is inherently their own capabilities, their own training and their own best practice. It's not necessarily the types of equipment that you have. 
So with that, I'm going to sort of shoot some wrap up or final questions to our panelists, and then we'll go into our Q&A here. I think we've answered a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, Sarah, if you had the top three pieces of advice or final thoughts that you wanted to share with our audience today about your experience going in the water, what would they be? Regulate your breathing. Make sure that you have that in your head immediately. Um, I guess one of the things that I did not do was change the batteries on my equipment. And so I did have to speculate whether or not my equipment would last through the hour that I was in the water at a 56 degree. So um, I would make sure that you maintain your equipment. And then also just, again, talk to yourself. I mean, you have to know what you're doing and you have to you have to think about this ahead of time before you hit that water. And that helped me considerably. Great. Tim, how about you? I would say, well, most importantly, don't panic. Uh, this, this is the second time I was in the water. The first time I was 12 years old, ice skating on a pond and I broke through the ice and I had to get out of that one. So that kind of came to mind as I went into the water after Caliente capsized. But the other two things are recognizing you have the ability to, su to survive, but more importantly, the will to survive. And I think that helped me a lot that I knew I could hang in long enough to get out of this mess I've gotten myself into. I say, great, thanks so much. And Mark? Uh, you had mentioned it and we had talked about it before, but uh, own your equipment. So if, you know, if it's your, your gear, uh, take time to look through it before a big race so you know uh, what side the arming is uh, on, the manual, you know, lanyard and what, what you have in there and that uh, the lights are tested and all that. And if you uh, pick up a life jacket off the boat, which happens sometimes in the, in the ocean racing boats, uh, the, the life jackets are supplied by the boat. You need to take a look at it and maybe blow the bladder up, make sure it's going to hold air and things like that. But own your stuff. Um, when you go in the water, uh, do things in order. Don't, number one, don't panic. Number two, get floating. Number three, breathe. Thanks so much. What, uh, what great pieces of uh, advice you have for all of us. Uh, just to clarify and to start working through our list of questions. So Mark, you had an AIS uh, MOB unit on your PFD, but it was in manual mode, not automatic. Is that correct? That is correct. And Sarah, remind us, did you have one as well? No, I did not. Okay. And have you added that to your inventory? Not since? yet. Santa's bringing it. <laughs> nice job. And, uh, you know, Tim, it's an unfair question because they didn't exist back in, uh, when your incident happened. But right. I'm curious, uh, you know, probably not for lake sailing, but uh, certainly, you know, if you were back on the lake or the bigger bodies of water, certainly something to consider is including that into your kit, I'm sure. Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, we're going to start working our way down the, uh, the question list here. We have plenty of time still, so I encourage folks to keep adding questions. Uh, the first one from uh, Rick Lilly. Uh, is there a move to develop a PFD, you know, with type three inherent buoyancy and supplemental inflation uh, with harness, of course. So as far as I'm aware, I want to say it's Musto recently came out with a product that is very similar to that. It has a fair degree of inherent buoyancy, plus the ability, um, plus some inflation capacity to, to increase the ultimate buoyancy. I don't believe it incorporates a harness, but uh, I'm sure a little Googling can give you the answers. But certainly there are lots of folks who are um, making advances in that. And I see Sally's rejoined us here. Sally, maybe you have a little bit more up-to-date information on this? Uh, yeah, the um, Musto Camara is uh, a hybrid. It does have inherent buoyancy and it also has inflation. It's not enough um, and it does not have a harness. So it, it's something that needs to be worked on, but the uh, total amount of buoyancy is not sufficient for ocean sailing. Thanks so much. Sure. Another one of the questions or, or comments really talks about, you know, auto inflation on multi hulls. And I think that, you know, there with anything we do, as the old saying goes, different ships, different long splices. And there are a lot of things that people will adamantly say is the best practice in the way it has to be done. And I guarantee you can find somebody else who will fundamentally disagree with them. I think the most important take home point is to know what you have, practice with what you have, religiously drill with what you have and have a standard of how you're gonna use it. And I think that that is probably the, the singular piece of advice that I would share in regards to that, in addition to don't panic. So 
you know, there's a lot of schools of thought that say you never want to have an auto inflation device on a vessel that is inherently somewhat designed to capsize. Um, this is probably not the forum for us to get together and, and discuss that decision making. So I do want to reiterate and, and sort of I think the big take home there is to know what your equipment is going to do. Is it set for auto inflation? Is it not set for auto inflation? Um, know that you can deflate it and reinflate it with an inflation tube. You, you have options. The best thing to, to know is how to utilize those options and plan for them. Uh, there is some great comments about sort of anecdotal evidence uh, or sort of best practice fact, in particular, losing sight of an MOB, uh, which reminds me of a great story. Uh, I was a part of another Hanson Medal um, award. In fact, the vessel that's over my shoulder is the schooner Summerwind. And while we were racing in Maine in 2010, uh, in solid fog in one of the lead ups to the Egamagan Reach Regatta, uh, a crew member fell off a vessel that we were in a crossing situation with. And we heard man overboard, quickly counted off, realized it wasn't us, but immediately responded. And we were towing a dinghy at the time. So my colleague jumped into the dinghy, cast off and paddled over to the individual in the water. But the visibility was probably no more than 100 feet at the time. And had they not been rescued by us pretty quickly, uh, it would have been a long, questionably successful search effort uh, to find them after the fact. So the visibility piece is really important. Uh, Mark referenced it, um, Sarah referenced it, but the opportunity to be seen, which means high visibility. You know, I, I always take a second of pause when I see folks in black foul weather gear or dark blue foul weather gear. Um, it looks very stylish on the streets of Newport, um, but certainly when we're looking at increasing our visibility, you know, bright colors, retro reflective tape, um, lights that are distinct and different from the surrounding lights are all techniques that we can use to make sure that we are highly visible, right? As I said before, if you can, you know, eliminate the search part of search and rescue, you've really gone a long way into the conversation. Uh, there's a comment from, from Joel about handheld VHFs, and I'm curious if any of our panelists have a handheld VHF sort of on their life jacket or as part of their kit. Uh, I do not. I don't either. Uh, I do have one on me a lot as a navigator or tactician, but I didn't have one when I went in the water. Yeah, I, I think in this, you know, they are getting small, but I think, you know, in particular with the AIS MOB unit, um, that is probably a better device uh, if I had to pick between the two. Um, and what we've also found is that, you know, between manual dexterity of cold hands and fingers, um, or just the fortitude to be able to speak clearly while there's waves crashing over you, the, the likelihood that you're gonna be able to effectively use it in the water may be pretty minimal. So, you know, if you have the option to add it, sure, but I, I would prioritize the uh, MOB AIS unit, personally. I think with the multi-hulls, they require a calamity pack now, and in the calamity pack is a handheld VHS radio, uh, your flare pistol, and also if you wear glasses, a pair of spare glasses, because there's a good chance that if you've gone over, you've probably lost them and can't see use the radio right that's a great great piece thank you for chiming in there tim um a question about the boats returning to you did any of the boats utilize the mob button to get back to your position i don't think they had them back when i went over we we did not um by the time, I mean, it wasn't accessible in the cockpit. So we, we added, Adam added that feature to the new boat, but we didn't have it in the old boat. So the GPS was down below by the engine. And the other one was on me. A, a technique that's used on the highest performing race boats that are going so fast, especially if they have the running track line, is to do a jog. So they throw the helm down or up and then back again. And that indicates enough of a variance in the course that that marks the position. You know, one of the things I always think about is often, you know, it's a three second hold on that button. And as we discussed, you know, in, in seven seconds, you're 300 feet away going 24 knots and, you know, three seconds is a long time in that circumstance to hold a button down. Mm -hmm. So any technique or multiple techniques that you can engage in mm -hmm. to sort of mark that position are certainly mm -hmm. of value. Uh, the old boot question. So for those of you that were able, how many people took off their boots? How many people kept them on? I took mine off immediate, almost immediately. It was like, you know, it was the more life-saving equipment and then eventually I took mine off. 
I was wearing top siders. I kicked them off and watched them float away. So at that point, I thought maybe I shouldn't have gotten rid of them. And I had uh, boots on and I kept them on because I, was just, I wasn't trying to swim. I was just floating and I felt like it would keep me warm. Yeah, you know, I think in many respects, a lot of the materials have changed. They, the boots are more inherently buoyant. You know, when some of this best practice came out, they were the big heavy rubber boots and, you know, they would weigh you down. And that might not be the case so much anymore with some of the high performance boots out there. Um, or some of the other footwear that people are wearing. So check out, you know, know, it's another great example of know your kit, know the equipment you're working with, and whether or not, you know, when you jump in the pool at the Safety at Sea seminar, try it both ways and, and see what you think of as best. There's a great question about body position. And one of the, the best old pieces of advice is still absolutely relevant. So I'll pull it up and share it with everybody. But it's called the heat escape lessening position or help position. If you're by yourself, the idea is essentially to get into the fetal position, huddled up with your knees to your chest. The less surface area you can expose to the water, the better served you're going to be. Uh, in similar fashion, if you are with a group of people, um, best to huddle up. You present a much larger target to an entity trying to rescue you. Um, likewise, you, you can even notice the pool of water in between you all will be warmer. And certainly that body warmth and minimizing the exposure obviously is the ideal. Um, so, you know, I always joke about this because it, it's one of sort of the first things you learn in scouts or water safety class or similar, but it is still, you know, it has stood the test of time and is still a great resource should you find yourself in the water. Um, did any of the boats that you were on deploy a, a mom unit or other type of man overboard device or throw a life ring and were you able to get to it uh, in any of your circumstances? Uh, mine did not, but my when I initially went over because the boat had auto tacked, broached and um, rounded up and broached, and she was on her side for about six minutes, I was gone. You know, and the visibility as well. Um, so when uh, they they used a rescue bag when they came and picked me up, so I did. Ha they did use that at that point, but they did not in on an immediate piece for the, for the mom. And uh, Meridian, we did not get that deployed. That was a mistake that we made by the time uh, they felt, uh, thought of it, uh, basically had gone too far and I thought it would confuse the issue having the, uh, the mob, mom uh, deployed in a location that wasn't right where I was. Right, yeah, you know, when you do your crew overboard drills, is there anybody assigned to deploy those pieces of equipment? Yes, there is. But in that, it's the armchair quarterback right now. <laughs> you know, when you're out there and uh, things are happening, uh, you don't necessarily uh, react exactly correctly. Correct. You know, re redundancy in that department is always a good one, having a couple people who are prepared to do that. Um, you know, there's another bunch of comments about the PLBs and the AISs. So I just want to touch on that again for a second, remind folks. The, the PLB is an EPIRB based system. It, it functions the same way. It, it goes up to a satellite and then to a rescue coordination center. The uh, MOB AIS units send a signal and transmit via VHF radio to any boat in the vicinity that has an AIS. So it's not just between the boat that you fell off of and you, it's between any boat that is essentially within line of sight of that transmitter that will uh, get an alarm that there is a, a person in the water, again, coded by the MMSI. So um, a great resource to have. Uh, just scrolling through the questions here. You know, we, we are coming up on the 1230 mark. So what I'd love to do is just uh, give our panelists uh, a minute to take a sip of water. Uh, formally say thank you to them. Thank you to Sally Honey for participating today on behalf of US and World Sailing. Uh, thank you to Rick Hayes, Clark Pella and the organizing committee uh, for putting the event together today. Uh, I'm going to share with some fo with folks the couple other resources that we've identified, as well as fantastic write-ups and videos about our panelists' experience in the water. We'll take uh, a two-minute break here, and then we'll come right back and keep going through the questions, maybe for another half hour or so, if everybody's amenable. So once again, thank you so much for joining us for the first minute, How to Survive Being a Crew Member in the Water. And we look forward to seeing you out there. Take care.
So folks, as I mentioned, we're just going to have this slide up for uh, a minute or two if folks want to copy it down. We'll also be emailing you the links included. Um, and then we'll come back here in uh, about two minutes and we'll keep going with our questions for another half hour or so. We'll jump right back in uh, with a couple questions and some answers to some of the other questions. There was one about equipment usage and inspections for the Mac race. And I reached out to the organizing committee since I am not a frequent sailor of the Mac. Um, and yes, there are inspections that occur for any first time participants. Uh, anybody can volunteer to have their vessel inspected for any of the races. And there are random spot inspections that occur after the race as well. So certainly an aspect of it. You know, I think that that's an interesting point in general about, again, the familiarization of equipment, um, how we utilize it. I was actually teaching a safety at sea seminar, uh, not at Chicago and doing the on water section where we get underway and practice man overboard recovery, crew overboard recovery. And this was a, in particular, a cruising boat that had a lot of equipment and a man overboard pole or what we call an Oscar pole. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, it is a long, usually tube that has the Oscar flag on it. Uh, on larger vessels, there's a radar reflector. Uh, usually it's attached to a life ring. So a great device, especially to increase that visibility and wave action. And we threw it in the water and I was very excited to use it as a marker and it promptly went straight to the bottom. So we have to take care of our equipment and we have to know it works. You know, along those lines, all of our panelists have talked about uh, different equipment sort of either underperforming or uh, a critical failure. So, you know, we should know our equipment. We should know how it is intended to perform. We should also recognize that occasionally it will not perform and not let that be a paralyzing feature. So again, get in the habit of reaching for that inflation cord on your PFD rather than relying on it to auto inflate. Know how that strobe light works. Know where it's located. Repack that little kit you bring with you every time but always be in the process of going through that equipment, right? It's, you know, just because you put a fresh pair of batteries into something 10 years ago, doesn't mean that they're still good. So it, it's a little investments that will probably pay big dividends at the end of the day um, in terms of knowing your equipment and knowing that it's going to function appropriately. Mm -hmm. Sally, you're back with us. Uh, do you have some comments to add here? I do. I just wanted to make one more point about inflatable life jackets. Um, they are great, and when they work, um, when the inflation, automatic inflation works, it's, it's wonderful. But I wanted to point out that they are all U.S. Coast Guard approved as manually inflatable life jackets. So the Coast Guard approves them, um, assuming that you will be using the cord to inflate them. And they, um, they, um, consider the automatic inflation to be a secondary inflation. So I think everybody needs to understand exactly how that equipment is intended to, to work. You can't always rely on the auto inflation to, uh, to work for you. 
Great. Thanks so much. Um, again, there, there've been some more questions about the AIS beacons, uh, you know, the, the pairing that happens and, and each device does it a little bit differently. The one that I put up there uh, pairs through a, a sort of software update through your computer screen. What you're doing there is you're programming your particular vessels AIS if it receives that particular beacon signature to sound an alarm. But every AIS that receives that signature will certainly propagate it on the screen as a man overboard. Um, and the question is whether or not, you know, individual chart plotters or other software will sound an alarm. And I don't have enough up-to-date current information on whether that's the case with every unit, but the initial design was between the boat you fell off of and the um, individual in the water through sort of a DSC call that was that, that was happening and a recognition of the MMSI number. But any chart plotter that can pick up AIS or has AIS incorporated will receive the distinct AIS characteristics of an AIS MOB. So I hope that provides some clarity for folks. Um, just continuing to scan through the um, question, is it necessary to register your MOB to the boat's AIS? Um, again, that is certainly helpful because that if you register that number and it receives the call, it will sound the DSC alarm. So it, it creates a sort of another inherent automatic alarm. Um, certainly good to do. And much the same way that if you do carry a personal locator beacon, you should certainly log on to its registry and update it. Uh, it doesn't help if your registry says you're sailing between the Bahamas and Maine and you're doing the Transpac, right? They're still gonna follow up on it. They won't think it's a hoax call, but the more information they have at hand, the better off you're gonna be. Uh, there's a lot of comments and questions about retrieving the, the individual from the water. And I'd love to turn it back over to our panelists uh, and hear their thoughts on, on the particular experience of getting them out of the water. Um, Sarah, would you start us off? Sure. Um, I saw the boat coming towards me along with the Coast Guard boat. Um, obviously the spotlight was my first um, visibility, visual, as well as, you know, the Coast Guard has huge red panels on the sides that are all lit. Um, that I saw. But as the boat became closer, um, I did have somewhat of a fear. I told him not to hit me. Um, just kind of like, you know, okay, I've done this. Please don't hit me. Um, they, again, I said that they uh, threw a rescue bag and I was able to swim to that because I didn't have any physical injuries or at least, um, you know, I could swim to it. And then they pulled me in it is an open transom boat with a um, swim ladder on the back, which I was able to stand on. I attempted to get on board, but I couldn't do it. So then they dragged me on board. Um, because the Coast Guard was right there, they transported me in a um, basket and took me into Sturgeon Bay, again, about five miles off of the Sturgeon Bay shipping channel, which is where the Coast Guard station is. And so then I was then transported to the hospital in Door County for mild hypothermia. So it was just, got me on board, dragged me over the back end and took me away. Tim? Well, Kokomo was the boat that rescued us finally because Caliente was incapacitated being upside down. They had no way to control or move the boat, obviously. Um, what ended up happening is after they retrieved Mark Mueller and myself, they went over to Caliente and had each one of those uh, remaining four crew members swim one by one over to Kokomo and bring them up to the stern. Uh, at that point, we were all on board. We were damn glad to see that everyone had survived. There was a lot of tears between uh, the six of us. But uh, the Captain of Kokomo asked us, do you guys want to stay on the boat or do you want to go with the Coast Guard? We said, no, we'll stay on the boat and finish the race because it was going to be my 25th Mac race. So it was kind of important. And Mark, how about you? Uh, for me, uh, that when they found me, uh, similar to what Sarah said, I was afraid that were, I was going to get under the boat or they were, you know, I was holding on to my life jacket. I was uh, afraid they were going to pull too hard on my life jacket that I would fall out of the life jacket. And I was also concerned about my feet getting under the boat and into the prop, but they, they were probably thinking about that uh, well ahead of me. Uh, they just manhandled me back alongside the boat to the stern and then just uh, fire, fireman drilled, uh, pulled me up 
off the stern, ended up uh, just on the cockpit floor. I wasn't much help on that. I wasn't any help on that. They, they did it all. Uh, and I uh, got my boots off and then got all my gear off, basically stripped down, down below, put some fleece on, got some hot water in me. Like I said before, I was shivering in the water, but when they pulled me out, I had stopped shivering. Um, but then when I got all my, those clothes off and got some fleece around me and some hot water in me, I started shivering again for, I don't know how long that, that took, but, um, and then I was exhausted. Um, I fell asleep for a little while. And then when I woke up, I was, uh, everything was just back to normal again. Thanks so much. You know, there, there's always the question of, of that, you know, how you pull the person out of the water and especially as more and more boats have sort of the open scoop transom, there's more of an inclination to bring somebody back there. But something to point out, you know, and, and forgive my high tech use of a Sharpie as an indicator, <laughs> right? But in significant wave action, right? This is the pivoting point of the boat, right? And you may find that a midships retrieval with appropriate block and tackle or, you know, a spinnaker harness or similar, uh, that piece of the ship is actually sort of pivoting rather than transiting or moving up and down. So while that opening might seem like a great first thought, there is the potential for serious injury back there, or the person falling under the boat. Um, the other thing too, is that if you do it amidships, right, that's further away from a propeller or a gear that's over the side or similar that you might be trailing. What we always encourage people to do is practice. And, and in reality, what you should be practicing with uh, is either an actual crew member in the water in a calm situation, or you know, it's not inconceivable to think about 200 pounds of weight right? Figuring what your average crew members wear. Uh, you will be well served. And even if you do it dockside on the brightest and sunniest of days, just slowly walking through the evolution, guaranteed you will learn something about the experience. So the more opportunities you can do to create these training scenarios for yourselves and your shipmates or your crew members, um, the better off you're going to be. Because what, what ultimately happens in terms of emergency response at sea is that it's very rarely textbook. It very rarely happens as we practiced it exactly. But what we do is we create enough of an inventory, enough of a playbook that we can sort of combine things and modify them to come together and create a functional solution. And then our plan becomes the best plan and a functional plan. So something to definitely think about. You know, there's a lot of uh, great uh, exemplary evidence of using a life sling using a dock line uh, attached to a harness or something under the chest and the armpits to pull somebody up. Uh, these are all things that you, you gotta have to practice for your boat to know what works best. And that's, you know, again, with all of this stuff, it, it's, it's the same piece of advice that we keep circling back to, which is know your equipment, know your platform, know your people. And if you combine all those three of those things, even a bad day on the water might turn out, turn out not to be the worst day on the water ever, so. Um, looking through some of the other questions, you know, uh, we always want to be sensitive to, to situations. There was a question about the Amedi incident. Uh, in particular, you know, there was a substantive report that came out about that. But I think a big take home is one, the commitment to real practice, uh, to real, to training in real scenarios and situations, and likewise, the knowledge and uh, about the type and function of equipment as well as practice and its use and inspection are all really, really relevant take home lessons. And I love it because Sally pops back up and that's my cue to, to bring her back on. So Sally, I'm sure you have some insight to share as well. Uh, yes, I was involved in the uh, M80 report and um, Rick was also there. Um, they, I think the big takeaway from the M80 report is how difficult it is with modern boats to control the bow when you're in a big seaway and trying to pick somebody up. And um, it, was, it was a problem. Um, the bow actually blew over John and, uh, and that may have been what, what killed him. Um, so what we've been working on in the past year is to, in the um, both Storm Chrysler Club and US Sailing and a number of um, groups are trying to come up with what we're calling the midline lift to try to keep the boat away from the person in the water. This is something that uh, professional sailors have been doing by sending a rescue swimmer into the water so that they don't get the boat itself anywhere near the person who's in the water. Um, with our kind of sailing, we don't have professional swimmers, um, but we are developing a way to deploy a life sling 
and then have the life sling um, attach basically a, a halyard to the life sling outboard of the lifelines. And so the person is pulled toward the boat and lifted up away from the water as the person gets close to the boat. Um, it's something that we're developing and th there will be more um, talk about it. But, but the point is to try to keep the bow of the boat away from the person in the water in a situation where the bow can't be controlled in uh, big waves. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'm just again reading through our, our question list, list here. Um, you know, there, there's a comment about snap shackles and, and the potential for release and, and the quick release. You know, nothing is perfect. And I think, again, it illustrates trust, verify, work with your equipment, give it a quick tug, um, be prepared for eventualities. Uh, you know, we, we can't bubble wrap the world and there is inherent risk in what we do. Um, it is knowing about our equipment and how it performs. You know, the, the best we can do, I think, is to ensure that we are using our equipment in its intended way um, to the best of our ability. Uh, and then check it and double check it and don't be afraid to replace it if something is suspect. You know, ultimately I think that, you know, and again, my views are my own and I'm not speaking on behalf of any other organization, but if I looked at the case of, of a quick release on the harness side of a tether and Mark situation, um, at 18 knots getting dragged through the water, I think the drowning factor would happen pretty quickly if I couldn't get out of that situation potentially. So there is an inherent value in, in the fact that it is more likely to release than something else. Um, but these are all just things that have to be considered and taken into to full context. So um, there is no perfect answer, only the, the best practices that we can come up with. Do any of our panelists have, have thoughts to add on that particular topic? No, I think you hit it. I mean, each one could be a winner or a loser, depending on the environment you're in. Whether you have a really quick release or not, have a quick release. I think the old adage, expect the unexpected, applies to sailing, especially racing boats out in the open water of Lake Michigan. So expect the unexpected. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a comment about being taught at safety at sea to only give victims liquid at room temperature. Uh, you know, it depends. The beauty of this day and age is that our access to definitive medical care, at least guidance from that, it has rapidly increased. You know, whether it's over VHF radio, over sat phone, um, or similar, you know, we can get the best guidance out there going pretty quickly. So, you know, gentle warming, always be gentle. There is one good piece of advice I did want to share in particular with removing people from cold water, which is the, the best practice is to do so horizontally, very gently. Um, that minimizes the potential for uh, cardiovascular shock if all of a sudden they're upright and out of the water. Um, but again, we also want to get them out of the water and, and spending hours trying to do something in a very delicate maneuver, um, increasing other extenuating circumstances can be a problem too. We have to always risk manage in these situations and do the best we can with the resources at hand. And I think that is also a very important thing to remember as well. I think we've hit on all of the questions that have been posted. Um, I'm just giving them a quick scan through, but um, I always love to give our panelists uh, another opportunity for a, a closing comment or two. Uh, Tim, you want to start us off? Any final thoughts for us? Uh, well, I wasn't quite prepared for that, but I'll do my best. Um, I still enjoy the sport. It's a sport of a lifetime. I've met some wonderful people in the process, and these kind of episodes create a bond that lasts for a lifetime. Uh, I continued to sail on Caliente two years later in the Chicago Mac just to kind of make sure that I was still able to handle that crazy ass boat that was built. <laughs> Just a quick one, Sunday morning when we were passing uh, Point Betsy, I remember laying down below and the boat was just heaving back and forth, flying across the waves. And I heard the skipper tell the owner, you gotta slow the boat down, Mike, 29 knots is too fast. Mm. But, um, you know, you, you, at times I guess you do live for the moment. So it was a lot of fun until the, until the capsize happened. But uh, I'd still go back and do it again. Great. Sarah, how about you? 
Um, well, you know, I appreciate all the opportunities that I had in sailing. And then that was um, because it was diverse and I had a lot of training and opportunities that um, really prepared me for that, but also the preparation of the crew. They had done the safety at sea committee um, through the MAC, um, you know, through the Chicago MAC and everything else. So they did have practice and they had that conversation prior to anything happening. So uh, I, the preparation, our skipper said, the reason why they made it is because of the preparation. And, you know, as always, thanks for coming back, <laughs> you know. Great. And Mark? Um, I think this has been a good discussion. Uh, one piece of um, safety gear we haven't mentioned is a headlamp. I, I did go out and get a nice waterproof a headlamp uh, that comes into play, not only for in the water, but uh, around the boat, different uh, uh, extreme environments. But uh, I had a headlamp when I went in the water around my neck, you know, because it, uh, it wasn't up on my head. And I never thought of it the whole time I was in the water. But now I consider the headlamp a piece of safety gear, and, I, and hopefully I'll remember that I got it if I need it. Yeah, great. And Sally, I'm, I'm going to ask you to join us for another quick second uh, to see if you have any parting thoughts for our audience. Um, just that uh, I think this whole hour and a half has been excellent. Um, I think the more people think about their gear and what they would do in a situation, either whether they're on the boat or on, in the water, is terrific. So um, congratulations on pulling this together. And thank you to all three of you panelists for sharing your experiences. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. Well, to Sally and our panelists, thank you once again. And thank you to the Chicago Yacht Club uh, Race to Mackinac Committee for hosting this event. Uh, and we look forward to following up with you a little bit of uh, email correspondence. And uh, with that, we'll say fair winds. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you.